Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting us. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, special thanks to all our colleagues in Poland, all the in Poland colleagues who hear us. Uh, what you see actually on the screen before I start the formal part is these two houses that you can see are reconstructions of a building that we made this summer. Um, you're supposed to see a one story and two story buildings, so these are our interpretation of what uh, Tripedia houses may have looked like. Uh, our intention is, uh, unfortunately, to burn these houses down eventually. And the local mayor uh, has promised that uh, he will stay in front of them, lay in front of them, in front of them and not let us do that because he wants to preserve them for, uh, for their local community. Anyway, uh, uh, what uh, we're going to do today is a double act. Uh, I will start. Uh, uh, I will start with introduction to very brief introduction to the phenomena of the Denny Tripolian network and to the big problem of uh, and the main topic of our talk, which is these very big sites, which have been referred now to mega uh, as cities, which we are really trying to. Uh, unpack that, term, uh, that terminology, whether we indeed we can talk about urban forms that early in time. And also we will try to illustrate the research challenges that study of these sites represent. And John later will take over and by, again, very brief uh, overview of our results for the three years of our research to see whether where we went, where we got to in our understanding of these sites, we think that we managed to address a lot of the issues that when we started that project with our um, understanding of these sites, I think we've come a long way and perhaps even went back from what we thought to begin with uh, that these sites may have represent. And of course, as, as is always the case, we think we, although we gave a lot of answers to many questions, we pose a new questions that perhaps it will be very difficult. Well, at least at the moment, we don't know the answers yet. Right, so let's first place us in time and space. So, Kukuteli Tripolia is a vast network that it occupies, the, well, which is now found in the, in the ter territory of two present countries, <coughs> and of course, what is the tradition in these places to have different names for the different for the same phenomena? It is called Kukuteni in Romania and Tripilie in Ukraine. What you see on the screen is the Russian pronunciation of that phenomena, which is Tripolie. Uh, today we will uh, spend our time <laughs> mostly on these sites that are sandwiched between the pyramids and uh, Stonehenge, they're well placed into the fourth millennium Cal BC, but the Kukuteni phenomenon started much earlier. It started somewhere in the middle of the, uh, in the mid fifth millennium BC. And what is important to, to know for that is that Kukuteni Tripoli uh, started where the others left off, if I, if I can put it in that way, because the fifth millennium, BC in Europe, uh, or in, if you want to prefer in Kibutius, in Kibutasian terms, old Europe starts to crumble and disappear. And this is exactly where these people take off and continue to live in a, in a way which is in a way out of space and out of place. They continue to have a tradition which around them doesn't exist anymore. There is mobile, small communities living around. They continue to live in a particularly a uh, way which is the old, uh, the old Europe way. So, again, I said that I had to present a very brief introduction to this. It's impossible really to give you uh, 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 an exhaustive account of what Google Daniel Tripoli looks like, but there are two or three components that you, you have to know about this, uh, uh, this phenomenon. And that's that most of um, what we know about this network comes from settlement contexts. Uh, there are hardly any cemeteries. Uh, there are 
some cemeteries that would appear towards the end of uh, the tail end of, uh, of, of that network. There are single buried bodies found here and there, but in general, these people do not bury in conventional sort of way. So all we know comes from the settlement context. And these are the same, the same houses, the our houses, but from the back. So there's, uh, you can see the front and the back. Uh, uh, the, uh, you can, if you read the literature, you'll see that there is these very bold reconstructions here of a really massive, really massive structures, which I would like to take with a pinch of salt. Uh, they are, uh, they are based, these reconstructions are based on these house models that you can see, and as you can see that they are on what I would call stilts. But in the view of the Ukrainians and the most of the, the, the Romanians, they reconstruct them as a two-story, full-blown two-story two buildings uh, of, of that really mega style. Uh, and what the, they did with their sites is to, uh, the, the end of each settlement was believed to uh, come uh, with a massive fire in which all of the buildings were burnt at the same time. This is what is believed and has been argued for a long time with a lot of ink and blood spilled over it whether this is indeed the case. And for the moment, this is the predominant and very difficult to argue against uh, hypothesis in both Romanian and uh, Ukrainian archaeology. The second key component of, uh, of the Kukutevich Royal phenomenon is these people really go for clay. Uh, their material culture consists predominantly of clay artifacts. Of course, they do have flint, they have metal, they have stone, but in incomparable amounts, what they really, really have is uh, clay objects. There is more than 30,000 zoomorphic uh, and anthropomorphic figurines known by now. And what they're really very famous is, is this wonderful pottery of which I just put only one example, uh, uh, which if you can look closely, you'll see that there is three-way symmetry of that, which is believed to be achieved only by Escher many, many, many years after. So it's really a very highly specialized production which is one of the arguments that has been used in the literature that we can probably talk about um, craft specialization and therefore for the development or the presence of complex societies because it is believed that you cannot just be a potter that will go out of, the, of your house and make these beautiful pots. So, beautiful that they are and those of you who know me and John that we have a long-term interest in material culture, this is not why we actually took this project. Uh, whether you, uh, I really don't know the audience about your interest, but I'm sure that in some way in your life, perhaps you have heard of some of these uh, uh, agglomerations, which increasingly uh, are difficult to explain in the terms and the knowledge that we have. So, how did we come to it is because we were very inspired by Roland Fletcher who came to Durham uh, as a fellow visitor and said, well, why don't you do something about these big sites? Because he, they, they have been known that there are these big sites in the be here, but because of the Iron Curtain and because of the language barrier, it was very difficult to do anything there. So that's how we we came into the scene, and you will, there is very, uh, there is a certain amount of literature about these particular sites. There is no agreement how we're going to call them, and you will see big problematic sites, uh, big weird sites, big anomalous sites, proto city cities, you name it, it's all in the literature. So, what we're trying to see is let's see what actually they look like, and how big is big. So, in order to get it closer to home, and since tonight there, is the, there will be the, on the TV the Great Fire of London. So this is a map of uh, London before the fire. And this is one of our sites. And um, John assures me that he made it to scale. So I, I trust him that he makes it scale. So if you want to, again, here we are. 
There you go. So that's what one of these sites looks like. So uh, they're really, really fast. So um, the Ukrainians, for a very, they, they have been known for a very long time. They've been known since the 19th century. And they really haven't paid particular attention to them. Uh, only Petrov in 47 uh, tried to uh, make fuss about, to make a point that perhaps they are they're dealing with something else. But since his work is never published, well published in 1992, it wasn't really uh, at all influential at the time. This is my favorite uh, quote, which is, of course, in a very Russian style, in a very uh, Soviet way. It's an intertribal inter 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 census based on fraternal uh, basis. But the vast majority of the Ukrainian and Russian literature really deals with uh, how many people were living there, how many would they have been using. They were really mainly studies of demography, demography and what the implications might be. But when I say the implications, not the rigorous implications of which are sort of um, uh, accompanied by good interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary studies, but more like any sorts of claims. And these are roughly done in, in the 70s and the 80s uh, in the former Soviet Union. Well, this now proves to be uh, one of the things that John Cobbs will dwell on it later uh, that has now played into something what we call a maximalist view because these estimates now come to haunt us because people take this as, at, at face value and things may get out of proportion as you can probably see later. So um, where we come in is that there has been a very weak voice in uh, um, Ukrainian um, archaeology that is trying to make the case that perhaps we can actually speak from very early form of urban sites in fourth millennium uh, Europe. And uh, the urban, the, there is a little bit we have to understand that Ukrainian archaeology is still very much trapped in the cultural historical approach. So therefore, the, the chiefdom and the complex chiefdom come to the, goes hand in hand for them for uh, proto-urban. There is no such a developed um, tradition of discussion of what actually is a chiefdom and what actually is a city. They, very often when you read the literature, you get lost of what exactly uh, uh, the, the, the author means. But basically, uh, uh, there are two camps, if I have to put it like that, in Ukraine. One that believes that these are big villages, and one that believes that they are proto-cities, proto basically. Right, so where we come in is that uh, when Ronald Fletcher <laughs> tried to convince us to, uh, to, uh, to take on this project, or rather to apply for grants for that, uh, it was within his research, he's interested in the limits of settlement growth, and he has globally, through time and space, and he has slaved over a long uh, list of sites all over the world, and has put a very strong case, I would say, that humans start to live in small societies, in small compact settlements. And come time, in a, in a certain time, that residential density starts to drop and people start to live in a bigger site but with a less density. And he introduces several boundaries, which is one hectare, 100 hectares, and this is what you see on the screen. And each of these is repeated. So you can see that all of these, uh, later when that's uh, 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 the, the next boundary of 100 hectares follows exactly the same trajectory. The next boundary of 100 uh, kilo, uh, square kilometers follows the same and the same. And so, as you can see, we are following, we are following here. So, we have to see whether indeed this is the case. We have to uh, explore, interrogate the evidence, and see whether indeed we can argue for that, uh, for that case. Before uh, Ron Fletcher, however, there is the, is the work of um, Linda Ellis, and this is a rather outdated map, which argues for hierarchy of sites. And as you can see, the small dots are obviously the, the little sites, the slightly bigger dots are the bigger sites, and the, the, the biggest of all, like that one where that's our site where, where we are excavating uh, for the last three years, are on the top of hierarchy. Now, uh, I decided to leave that map for, for two reasons. And the first reason is that, because indeed, 
even the topic of today is these big sites and what are they really like, how they operate, do they, are they possible? But we should not forget that there is a million and other, other small sites, they are there. They are, the small sites seem to be forgotten when you discuss this uh, phenomenon of big sites. And the other uh, uh, thing that I have to say about this map is when I say this is outdated, that now we know that these big sites do not appear only in that area of Ukraine, which was believed to be the case. <coughs> these big sites appear only between Dniester and Southern Bok. Now we know that they are also found in the, in the whole of, uh, of present Ukraine. Funnily enough, not in Romania. In Romania they don't have this, they only uh, remain in, in, um, in Ukraine. Right. So, the first sites that appear, like, appear the, with anomalously big are from the very beginning of the Kukutenian uh, period. They, in the, these are all bases that you see as ceramic bases. That's how the chronology works at the moment. So uh, A, B, and C are based on development of pottery. Uh, of pottery. Uh, and in each uh, of next stage and next phase of this uh, of, of, of that phenomenon, a bigger and bigger size start to appear. But what I would really like to point out in this in, in this slide is that something which is a hallmark of these settlements, and this is the concentricity of their plan. Uh, that implies uh, f uh, forward planning, something which you, they didn't just augment their existing style, the, the site was sm small, and therefore they add more houses and add more houses. No, it doesn't seem to be the case. From the very beginning, whenever they were uh, deciding to settle, they were there was, they were knew what they were going to do, and they were following that pattern of concentric. Whether that will be slightly in the shape of a uh, of a dartboard like the penny, or it's uh, following more the, uh, uh, the topography of sites here in Vilna, this principle of concentricity remains throughout. Now, uh, how many of these big sites? Well, what we we, where we are talking about? Well, at the moment we have 139 of them which, in, com in comparison to all of the other smaller sites, the, the sites which are smaller than 10 hectares, is between, depending who you read and depending who you believe, between 2 or 4 percent of the whole of the uh, um, sites in Ukraine. So you may say that this is not necessarily very big, but still you cannot uh, uh, disregard this, uh, this fact. And the sites that we are interested the moment uh, in, in this particular document, we're going to talk about is this one, is these blue, light blue ones. So as you, as you can see, they appear from the very beginning when, when the, uh, uh, from the inception of, of, of that network. And apart from here, in that, that space, they see, and obviously the demise and the, 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 the piece at the tail end of, 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 the, of that network, they seem to be very persistent. So this is not something that appeared and disappeared, no. They were really going for these big sites throughout. And the other interesting thing you can see that the relatively small sites, if you can consider that 30 hectare site is a small site, so this from 10 to 30 hectares is rather, the, the, the number of these sites increasing uh, through, through time. And just for reference, I, I was recently told by my team quite years and that there have been more than 17 hectares. So you can see whether where we fit in, in this uh, in this graph. And before I hand out to, to John, uh, you what I would like to point out is that uh, we it's not that uh, the, the the trajectories <coughs> of these sites appear to be Consistent. They're not just oh, it's the same, but it's got bigger. No, but they're uh, following. If, if 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 a particular plan was in mind, they were trying to achieve it. The, the, the residential density. If the, they were following, they were after a small residential density, which is this one. They kept it from the very beginning to the very end. There was this trajectory. Certain sites, 
were protesting or wanted, or they were really going to, to keep the, uh, the low residential density, which is some particular one here. Other sites, however, became bigger, but highly packed. And this highly packed of, uh, uh, site, which is here, is more what you would expect from a normal, quote unquote, urban development, which is denser. What, what will child will call a uh, uh, city, and these are the ones that, that you would expect. However, even these are much, much smaller in residential density than what a normal uh, program city will look like. So, John? Thank you. Um, I must apologize for the croakiness of my voice. Normally when you, um, you give a performance, there are five people in the audience who are coughing. Well, this time it's going to be the speaker. I'm sorry about that. So, we have an idea then about the size of these sites, the mega sites. How could they possibly grow so big? Well, Rowan Fletcher was very interested in Triprinia megasites because um, they were the only global exception to his two rules that limited the size of agricultural settlements. One of them, that there was an interaction limit, a density of people on the site of 300, 600 people per hectare. And in the early um, geophysical plots, Triprinia went beyond that. There was also a limit on the size of the settlements for ease of communication, so a communication limit of 100 hectares. <coughs> and we were very interested to see if that continued to be the case with new geophysical work, and, and we found that the, there were ways around these two limits. <coughs> There were some very, very good innovative geophysical uh, and satellite uh, imagery work done in the 1970s and 80s by the Ukrainian teams and the Russian teams. But in the last um, 10 years or so, there's been a, a second revolution in uh, a methodological and a conceptual revolution in, in which large scale and very high precision magnetometry provides really detailed plans of these sites such that we've never had before. And on the simplest level, um, these new plans show many new kinds of structures, new elements on the sites that were never known before. Ditches and paleo channels and tracks and you can read them all out like that. Extraordinary number. And if you start to look at these and put these into um, uh, a set of special <coughs> relationships, then the new elements and their combinations reveal a far greater degree of internal ordering than was ever detectable on the old plans. So that's really the platform um, for uh, uh, another kind of understanding. <coughs> but the health warning for everyone here is this talk is entirely superficial until we can work out a chronological sequence for the mega site to show that there were maybe 50 houses occupied simultaneously, or 500, or 1500. Until we do that, um, we really have not solved the mega site problem, and we're of course working. <coughs> so the first complete. Um, megasite plan done with um, modern geophysics was from this site of Nedelivka, which I think you can see, and uh, we've got a number of different colours here. <coughs> the red and uh, um, uh, 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 burnt houses, that's what we saw earlier, um, the Durham purple are uh, unburnt houses, and the green is probably unburnt houses, but certainly weaker geophysical signal. And, and you can see there's a lot of regularity about that plan. Now one of the things that we found 
was that there is a perimeter ditch defining that's two points of it, but it goes for much of the perimeter uh, of the, the megasite. What does it mean to have this in terms of planning? Do you dig a ditch at the beginning? Do you dig it at the end? Do you dig it in the middle? There are arguments either way. Very hard to dig. The other really amazing thing that came out of the new geophysics was a series of structures that are much larger than houses, which we call assembly houses, uh, and they're regularly spaced around the uh, concentric rings. So if you want to look at, take one of these, what we call a circuit then, <coughs> each of these is a house, and this, uh, there are two main circuits, and a perimeter ditch. <coughs> Round uh, the circuits, we found 23 assembly houses, six on their own, five in pairs, two trios, and one um, quarter with no assembly house at all. So lots of variability there. Almost all of them are rectangular. Some of them are quite small, only just bigger than the normal house. But one of them, as you'll see, is absolutely enormous. That's uh, length versus width, and there's one out there which we call, um, would you believe, the megastructure, and uh, we excavated the megastructure which in its entirety is 66 by 21 metres um, in size, and we excavated that um, in the 2012 season. And some of the um, assembly houses are completely burnt, or well, not at all, but most of them only have the walls and the outside burnt. In the middle, they're not burnt at all. So there are lots of interesting things about them. But in a four-year project, we can't excavate very many of them. But we have excavated the biggest, and that's it. And uh, I'm taking the kite photo. And what you have there is the red lines what, where we would suggest um, were uh, walls, or open door. And what you have in blue are features of the kind that you found in, of find in normal houses, but much, much bigger than the normal house. So there's a podium, which is three times bigger than, than normal. Uh, there's a series of platforms, 5K platforms, also much bigger than usual. And that is the biggest 5K bin in the Trapillion culture. And you saw it first here in London. <laughs> So we think of the assembly houses then, then as foci for um, the quarters, the, uh, the divisions of the um, site that we'll come on to. And they have not only structural but also architectural parallels, domestic houses. And intriguingly, that there aren't really sort of many more finds in the assembly houses, or at least the big one we looked at, than you get in a normal house. Now, the National Geographic Society, as you can imagine, was extremely disappointed in this finding since they gave us lots of money to find hundreds of figurines and produce a temple in this great structure. But there were fewer figurines than in a normal house. So that's a bit sad for the National Geographic. <laughs> a bit like Silbury Hill, really. Okay. There was, however, one single exception which was a family of 25 baby pots, perhaps a gift from 25 houses, which would have been put on a shelf, and when the building was destroyed, they fell down, uh, and we found them all, all, all complete. And there, there, there's a ruler there. They're about um, Society of Antiquaries teacup size. They might well have been individual consumption. But the extraordinary thing about them, just one detail, um, for aficionados of East European prehistory, is that on some of them you find graphite painted ware, which is unique so far in the uh, Tripoli group. Um, the nearest that you find graphite painted ware is in southeast Romania. There's something going on there that's really, really interesting. Okay. So, if, as we believe, the assembly houses were public buildings, <coughs> meeting places with distinctive ritual functions, the householders clearly took their figurines away with them back to their own homes. Very important. 
Uh, and what we're left with then is the notion that the Assembly House is um, a, a public building, but really the domestic writ very large indeed. No sense of hierarchy or differentiation here, in one sense, except by size. So I mentioned just now the quarter, uh, and what we've tried to do here was to break down the overall size, which is um, a staggering 265 hectares, uh, into um, areas based on a number of criteria, but partly to do with assembly houses, partly to do with natural boundaries, like this, there's a paleo channel here, and various criteria. Now this is preliminary, and I'm sure you know, we can think of this and get some up. But it gives you a sense of how you can break down a total plan uh, and, and come up with something that is socially a bit more meaningful, it's a bit more sort of um, um, intimate than a massive plan. And each of the quarters uh, is comprised of a number of what we call neighbourhoods. And we've got neighbourhoods which have at least three houses. There's one up there that doesn't have many. It might not have lasted very long. But there are others, I think they go up to about 28, 30 houses in the neighbourhood. Um, so you have to have sort of bricks at the end of each neighbourhood and a number of houses within them. And there are over 150 of these on the site. Um, and each of the um, quarters has a different number of neighbourhoods. Some of them are quite linear, but some of them uh, are grouped in, in particular configurations like this one. This is one where you've got houses on uh, three, certainly maybe four sides, so we call it Nebelika Square. The next one is Lenin Square, but maybe not these days. Um, and that's the kind of thing where you can talk about a more intimate level of planning, where people you know, would have lived there in the last. <coughs> so, how, does, how did these findings then match up with Roland Fletcher's limits? Well, there's quite a lot of spatial differentiation. Um, he didn't have that before. There's much more internal spatial structuring, far more local groupings. And so this makes it easier to see how Trepinian people um, could cope with communication problems and interaction problems in lots more smaller um, uh, units. And so this three-tiered spatial structure of settlement, quarter, neighbourhood, um, I think helps us to resolve Fletcher's problems with the communication limit. And the density of structures um, is far lower than he imagined from the earlier plans. So they're not the global exception anymore. They do fit into the upper limits of what he's talking about, but they're not uh, so special. But this prompts another question, which is how is it <coughs> that you can integrate so many smaller groupings? <coughs> and this leads us into um, the third of our main topics, which is what is the status of the megasats? <coughs> and it takes us to this notion that Roland Fletcher has developed of the low density and the high density urbanism. And the basic thesis that Viseka alluded to was that the industrial age city starts compact and gets bigger, but it's increasingly low density. And you can think of examples from today, megalopolis, um, but this has been going on for a very long time. And in fact, these days, 10% um, of the world's surface is taken up with low density uh, cities and 25% of the entire world's population lives in low density settlements. So it's a huge issue here. So we're looking at the origins of something that's really big today. The other thing you find is that low density cities are occupied for much shorter periods than say great imperial capitals. 
Byzantium and Rome and London. And there's another variable that comes in here, which is more a sort of prehistoric variable, and that's the length of time from when agriculture started to the formation of big sites. And it's longer when you start off with high density urbanism, it's shorter when you start with low density urbanism. That's another key feature which works out the trophilia. <coughs> And, and another trait of low density sites is that you need well defended centres to develop out of arable areas. And that's a part of the definition which we don't really find yet uh, in the Trapini mega sites. But we do get the trend to decreasing density. And here's another beastly graph, I'm afraid you're going to have to stop. Here you've got two more lines to think about. There's a, a lower, oh no, didn't want that, sorry. Let's see if we can do that again. We've got a lower line there, so we've got low density there going across to here. That's a sort of low density, which is going uh, slightly lower density. That's the number of structures. And we've got another line up here quite early on, which has higher density, and that too the same. And we've got two stars in the audience, actually more than two stars. One of them is if you believe that Nebelivka um, was occupied all at the same time, so all 1,600 structures were occupied at the same time. And the other star down here is if Nebelivka was occupied sequentially, maybe two or three hundred houses at a time. And so it's quite a difference then in where the pattern fits in. So you've got to think about that, but uh, what I'd like to take you to take away is that there are two lines showing a decrease in settlement density. Just like Viserka showed there were two lines concerned with site sizes. Now the two stars locate two different positions that the various research teams have been working on. And there's a Ukrainian-German team who takes the Maximus view that Viserka talked about. Um, a very fast expanding Lebensraum with lots of um, people. And so three weeks ago, in an e-journal from the University of Kiel, the German Kiel, um, estimates for the population of Maidanetskoy another 250 hectare site, the same size, plus or minus, as Nebelivka, came out at the lowest at 12,000 people, and at the greatest at 46,000 people. That's a lot of ladies round. And <laughs> that's an amazing number when you think about it for a prehistoric settlement. Uh, and uh, when Viseka mentioned a pinch of salt, she really meant buckets full of salt <laughs> for this. And that estimate is based on the coeval occupation of all houses with the estimate of seven people per house. That's the basic, basic idea. Well, as you might imagine, the British team is a bit more modest in this respect. We take a minimalist view. Of this, we're quite happy to suggest. Uh, well, even if you take a minimalist view of uh, all houses at Nebelika occupied at the same time, you still come up to 9,000. But that's the point. We're not by any means convinced that the whole set of houses were occupied at the same time. That's the nub of it. That's why we need a good Bayesian model, as Alex will know, for AMS uh, dates for an internal chronology. And if you have seasonal sites, uh, you're not talking about such a large density of people, a large number of people, a high density, uh, and so there are other alternatives to the maximalist position. But even um, with a lot of people, but not a maximalist position, there is still the problem of how do you organize um, and sustain a population that's pretty big. And Greg Johnson, a number of years ago, 30 years ago, came upon the 
His magic number is seven. You probably each have a magic number that you like to think about. His number was seven. And what he realised is that you can integrate um, up to seven units in a decision-making way, but above that you need another level in the hierarchy, another level of decision-making. <coughs> so, how many levels of decision-making do you need on a megasite? Well, we'll come back to this, but um, the basic idea is you probably need four for Nebelivka. And it's quite hard to imagine how a four-level hierarchy would operate in prehistory, especially if there's no material uh, pointers to, to hierarchy. And at Maidanetskoy, with 46,000 people, you're to, talking about a five-level hierarchy, which, as you can see from the slide, we're not quite sure about. Hmm. What this really means is that the maximalist view <coughs> creates complexity as a day follows night. If you have that number of people, there's no way that you cannot have social complexity. And we're still trying to get to this question. So, scalar stress, uh, our hero. Start at, let's say, 500 houses at a time, not 1,500, but 500. And you've got 10 neighborhoods. Put those together and you've got seven um, quarters. Put those quarters together uh, and you've got about ten um, district councils. Put those together and you've got one parliament or Supreme Soviet or something. So that's your four-level hierarchy there in terms of decision-making. But it's not materialised. You don't see any sign of this hierarchy at the megasite. That's one thing. The, the next thing concerns, as you might imagine, logistical issues. If you have 12,000 people, 9,000 people, 500 people, there are logistical issues. They concern lots of different things, as you can imagine. Um, we're compiling stats on, on most of these, but the one where we've worked at quite a lot is the salt, and we'll look at that for just a moment, uh, in just a moment. Um, but we have, um, through Bruce Albert, um, made a preliminary pollen diagram with dates, so the, the lower date is about 4,000 Cal BC, the upper date is 3550 Cal BC, and the and that brackets the occupation of the megasite at Nebelivka, which is probably 200 years or so. And you can see from the patterns, I know everyone loves pollen diagrams, uh, you can see that there's a sort of big deforestation here, somewhere before the start of the occupation, it has to be said. And then there's quite low, lack of um, forest cover. And then there's a rebound after the end of the megasite, as you might imagine, too. So it's quite low sort of levels of tree cover. But um, if you have thousands and thousands of people, uh, everybody on the project expected there to be a much bigger human impact than we see in the pollen diagram. There's not such a big human impact. So that's a very sort of curious uh, preliminary finding. I think it's going to be confirmed. It looks, it looks solid. There's not as much human impact as possible. What does that mean for the models and the site numbers that we're talking about? Okay, logistics and salt. Now, when we looked at initially at a 20 hectare site, a baby site, we were looking at a minimum of over 2,700 kilograms of salt per year based on uh, Pretty low levels, 5 grams of salt per day per human, and then 10 grams of salt per day per head of cattle, kind of thing that John Landris is, is well aware of. And if you take that up, you convert that for the Maidanetskoy megasite, um, the minimum is 200,000 kilos in a year. 
and for your 46,000 people, it's 621,000 kilograms of salt per year. I mean, imagine uh, the amount of salt moved around <coughs> on icy roads in Britain, or rather not moved around on icy roads in Britain. And you see, these figures are just, just inconceivable. Just inconceivable. So although the quantities are not agreed, the scale of the salt movement, I think, is generally accepted. There's a lot of it moving around. But it's one of the big logistical issues. Finally, where does it come from? And that's still very much in dispute. And we have this sort of classic situation, that's the terrain. That area is where the, the mega sites are around here. That's another week uh, and the other sites nearby. And there are two areas where the salt could have come from. It's not certainly not local. One is from the East Carpathians, and the other is from the Black Sea, which is not a very salty sea. Now, if, it, if the salt comes from the Black Sea, um, the problem there is that we don't have any dated Neolithic salt exploitation sites, but it's much closer, and you can take it up, up the valleys. Over in the East Carpathians, there are dated salt exploitation sites dating to Kukateni, to Pilie, but it's much further away. It's, an, it's across the grain of the countryside. So that's a problem at the moment. The evidence doesn't really fit the Black Sea um, Limans very well, but one would imagine that that's where the salt came from. But in any case, it's a massive amount of salt. This is not just gift exchange, this is trade. The last point about logistics is you would expect with a city to have kind of logistical backup in the form of smaller sites in your hinterland or your your city territory, and we just do not have, at the moment, any contemporary sites closer than 15 kilometers. In other words, at the moment, it's very puzzling, but it seems as if there isn't much of a hinterland to the mega sites. And we're very worried about this, and this is another issue. And we have really been sending the students out in all weathers to look for sites, do field walking. We've um, yeah. supervised them from a distance, from cars. We've sent them out, but we've found very, very few sites. That's another big question for us. For you. The alternative, then. And at this point, if Ukrainian archaeologists were in the country, they'd either shoot me and then themselves, or just me, as you said there is a less permanent type of occupation. We might be talking about seasonal gatherings. We might be talking about pilgrimage sites. <coughs> After all, the sort of very short-term summer sites in America that last a month or more, not much more, can produce a mega site plan just like Nevelivka. That's only occupied for five weeks. Um, unfortunately, most of the blobs are not houses, but cars. <laughs> don't, don't worry. That's the kind of planning you can get for short-term sites. So, um, but there is no precedent for this in East European Neolithic and Copper Age uh, archaeology. Uh, 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 and in some ways, it raises as many problems uh, as, as it solves. But I think we have to look at it. So the conclusion then, uh, the preliminary conclusion about the status of megasites is if you think they're more likely to be seasonal, not so permanently occupied, then the less likely they are to be urban, even though they would be low density sites, but they wouldn't be low density urban sites. But if you think that these big sites are occupied more or less permanently, and quite a lot of the site is occupied at the same time, then you would tend towards the low-density urban uh, 
designation. And that's where we are at the moment, which is, um, I can't see a fence on which to sit, but I think we're sitting on it at the moment. There's a maximalist view? No problem. Okay, where are we then? Well, we have the first complete megasite plan based on modern geophysics. We've discovered ways of avoiding interaction limits and communication limits. We found lots of neighbourhood groups, but we're still working on how to integrate them. We're not very sure about four-level hierarchies. Uh, what is coming out in the, the recent publications of the Ukrainian-German team and our team is that there are these maximalist and minimalist positions. They're coming out and they're becoming increasingly well-defined and separate. And we have to work on that and see what's going on. And we have spoken and perhaps made possible the suggestion that megasites may have been seasonal and they may have been sequential. And whether you're a maximalist or a minimalist, you will decide whether these are low-density urban sites or low-density non-urban sites. And that, ladies and gentlemen and fellows, is as far as we can go just at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, you will remember me. 
rambling on about the accessible surrounding resource zones on a huge site like this. And, uh, this involves transport, provisioning. Did they have animals? No. Um, what is put to the side to a sledge and, and cattle. But this seems to be taking place in the forest uh, step uh, between Venice and Kiervermeister uh, sort of belt. Yeah. Um, so it, it relates, it must start by relating to that environment, surely. Um, and the Gumelnik site and Kukatini sites seem to me to identify what are called climax neolithic by the example of vegetation, which took the neolithic mode of behavior as far as it could go without becoming something else. And this, uh, your phenomenon, um, doesn't quite seem to be doing the same thing. It's, uh, it's not progressing towards a Bronze Age or anything like that. Um, and you say there are no uh, precedents for a seasonal gathering site. Well, I, I wonder, because it seems to me in the Neolithic, and not just in that region, even in Britain, it's what uh, uh, the topic I would refer to under fairs and markets and gatherings without begging the question of trade or exchange or any other sort of assembly, but certainly with a social purpose, usually on um, broad uplands uh, with a nice view, um, like Smithfield Market, which is part of such a uh, thing over uh, uh, London, coming down York Way. Uh, so all over the place you have this, and, and in Kukatani, Gumelnik's uh, sites, but there are no such um, topographical uh, incentives in your area. But it, it does look uh, quite a provisional, or at least a provisional explanation of a gathering uh, might ease things a bit. Gordon Child, um, despite his ideological preferences, drew up uh, a list of criteria for urbanism. Uh, and, uh, I can't remember all of them. Classes and hierarchies in society, you don't have that. Uh, trade craft and specialization, you may have that. Uh, works, uh, municipal works, so to speak, there's a whole list of them. And you probably produced your own. Um, you, you're well aware, and I, I don't need to tell you that Tripoli phases are pottery styles. I mean, just so that the people who are not involved with this realize that they're not a sequence A, B, C uh, in time. Um, so, I could ramble on at length, as you well know, John. Um, you have a special chance to react. Julie, can you start with whichever? Give me whatever you don't feel comfortable with. Right. Right, let me just. Any other question I can answer just 
Well, let's. If we start with the excavation evidence that you mentioned, Jill. Um, yeah, we've. <coughs> We've downplayed this, this uh, tonight, but we have, between, between the two teams, excavated um, three houses, um, three very large pits near the houses, which indeed have masses of domestic um, debris there, um, and a megastructure. Um, and we've also, um, f for reasons of trying to get um, a, a wide range of um, uh, samples for AMS dating from as many parts of the site as we can get. We've excavated um, now over 80 small test pits. Um, the geophysics um, uh, allows us to put the test pit down exactly on the house, and we've excavated 80 of these, usually two meters by one meter. So we've got 80 samples of architecture, 80 samples of ceramics and other stuff from the houses, um, but also a series of um, samples, most of which in fact have got collagen and can be dated and we're now negotiating with Oxford to get as many dates as possible from, from this. Um, but we have done quite a lot of excavation and the last thing we've excavated, which touches on one of John Landris's points, is that we've excavated a structure that the Ukrainians would interpret as a pottery kiln. Um, and, and there are a number of other very, very high um, resolution um, magnetic anomalies which suggest there might be more kilns on the site. But we're still trying to work out the exact function of this strange feature, but it's possible that it's a kiln. Um, so can I just, yes, can I just add to that? Uh, uh, if I might gap in the middle, which we've looked at in many ways, and in every case it turns out to be a real gap. In other words, that there are no um, uh, geomagnetic anomalies, there is no deposition of surface material after ploughing. It's the hole in the donut. There's nothing there. Uh, and we would imagine that it's a sort of space that you could have for um, either horses, probably wild horses, or domestic animal, could be sheep, could be goat, could be cattle. We imagine that's more likely. Uh, uh, and, and there's also quite a big gap between the two house circuits, which might have been full of gardens, for instance, or even fields. I mean, sometimes there's a hundred meters between the house circuits. There's a substantial area there for different sorts of activities. Okay. 
Okay, so 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 that's that's the picture with the um, now whether it's a linear which is joined up or circular. Uh, I think what your question is really hinting at is that um, there is a there's a, an overall principle of planning here, a concentric circuit principle, but it's implemented in different ways. It's not necessarily very carefully um, organized. Indeed, there are many kinks uh, along the circuits, sometimes in both, sometimes in one. So there's lots of local um, variation then. Um, many different kinds of local groups um, taking a shared idea and putting it into practice in rather different ways. So whether we're talking about linear that's joined up, I'm not sure, but it, uh, I mean it certainly wouldn't wouldn't be impossible. But the idea is that um, there is a template, but it's very variably interpreted. Okay. So that's another one. Oh, there's a donut. <coughs> Let's see. The seasonality. Yeah. It's, I think it's <coughs> recognised now quite widely that um, it's very hard to get good seasonal data from uh, animal bone samples, uh, and indeed we're finding we're finding very few animal bones anyway. So we'll, we'll uh, I don't think we'll ever have a large enough sample of animal bones from which to extract um, reliable seasonal data. Um, but there are other ways of looking at seasonality, and one is the kind of plants that you get in the pollen diagram to see how that works out, to see what the, uh, the annual cycle is there. Uh, and the other way, which we're just um, developing, is um, the examination of the animal bones uh, for isotopic signals of, of diet. Um, and if there are several stages in this argument, but if there are different diets for, the, let's say, the cattle population, um, it could very well be that the cattle are pasturing on different areas. And some of these may be further, and some of, of these may be uh, closer. It may be that that's one way of getting uh, different sort of seasonal approaches through the mobility of the animals on whose bones have been deposited on the site. But we do accept that seasonality is very difficult to prove. Uh, uh, and if you talk to archaeologists who know a lot more about pilgrimage sites than I do, then that would not be difficult at the moment. Perhaps there are uh, fellows and colleagues here who know about pilgrimage sites. It's very hard to, to find particular material signatures for pilgrimage sites <coughs> as against normal um, residential sites, I believe. There's no, a it is a problem. Sorry. There is a problem. A pilgrimage usually takes place in spring, as Chaucer taught us, us, and if you look at the animal bones, you'll see near uh, oh. forming a proportion of the body. Okay, thank you, John. Right. Uh, so, um, one of John Andrews's points is that while you have, you seem to have a climax vegetation, which is true, um, there doesn't seem to be much progression towards the Bronze Age. And that is absolutely right. I mean, it, it, it's um, we're, we're beginning to see Trapelia as one of those sort of prehistoric dinosaurs in which almost everybody else around them has moved on and done other things. They've they've started to get interested in accumulation built up smaller, more flexible sites with different attitudes to place and new attitudes to uh, kinship and lineage and definitely um, much greater investment in metal, coppers and golds and silvers. Um, at the moment, Trapelia just is not interested in those things. They're interested in clay. And they don't seem to be interested a great deal in, in metal. There are very few compared to uh, other groups, especially in the fifth millennium. 
And so it, it, you're absolutely right, John. They're not moving towards the Bronze Age. They're saying, we don't want to be in the Bronze Age. I mean, we, we like it where we are. We're just fine being Neolithic. Nothing wrong with being Neolithic. And it, uh, an attitude I tell my students, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, so there is that question of what, are they stuck in a Gimbutasian group? You know, they keep on going, being Neolithic for a thousand years after everybody else has given up and moved on to exciting new, new nightclubs and other places. It's a very interesting pattern. They're, they're, they, they seem to be dinosaurs. A bit like Stonehenge, where everybody else in the early Bronze Age Europe, or Northwest Europe, has moved on to you know, small sites and they've forgotten about massive monuments and yet Stonehenge. Uh, a bit of a dinosaur. Yeah. Not quite <laughs> the same as the other sites. We think tri of Trapelia in this way too. I'm sorry, I'm just provoking you. Yeah, but you know what I mean? <laughs> I think there's that side of it. <laughs> Do you want to talk about Gordon and criteria? Oh, I guess I'm kind of weary of time. It's probably the... Uh, well, I think I'd like to say, I'd like to draw this to a few minutes. Maybe uh, uh, legacy discussions about Gordon shall have saved the cherry. <laughs> 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 Just what he would have wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, as all good research projects, what you've done is produce even more research questions. And clearly, your methodological journey has uh, thrown up with, with both, both new information but inevitably new questions. So clearly, the next thing is, is the question of, of um, sorting out an internal chronology for these sites. It's going to be a, a very important next step. And I think it will be very interesting to hear what your research brings up next. So thank you very much indeed.